go ahead and have a seat. Now God's people said, amen. amen. I'm supposed to say something about Sir South Bend, but I'm not sure I can improve on what Beckett did. How many of you guys would like to see Beckett back up here preaching? Yeah. You see those stones that are on your seat? You probably thought those were to throw at Pastor Nate after he got done talking about the Bears and Notre Dame. Uh, there is another purpose for him. His son did bail him out, so uh, I think Nate owes Beckett at least a trip to Starbucks for a donut or something. Uh, let me just say a, a welcome, a good morning to those of you who are joining us, especially for the first time. We're glad that you are here as we are continuing on in our series uh, entitled Preparing for the Promised Land. Uh, looking today eventually at Joshua chapter 4 and the importance of not forgetting what God has done for us. Not forgetting what God has done for us. On this point of not forgetting, I, I'll just uh, share uh, transparently. I used to pride myself on having a great memory, uh, but now at the ripe old age of 48, I can already sense that my memory is not what it used to be. How many of you can relate to that? Yeah, my family uh, teases me because we'll be watching a movie that we've seen before, and I will have no recollection of watching it. How many of you can relate to that? Yeah, some of you. Maybe you can't relate to that particular experience, but my guess is you have forgotten where you put your keys, right? You have forgotten where you put your phone. Uh, maybe you've forgotten the birthday of a loved one, right? We all forget stuff, right? We all forget stuff. And yet our memory problem is not a storage issue. In fact, I was reading about this recently. Uh, if it were possible to make a copy of everything in an average adult's brain, it would take 3.2 million DVDs to hold all the information. In other words, our memory problem is not a storage problem. It's a, it's a, it's a recall problem, right? This is why scientists tell us that we can only recall about 2 to 3% of what's in our brain's memory drive, which is why we get frustrated when we forget something because we know it's up there somewhere. Right? This is also why diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia are so tragic, because losing our memory is a form of losing our lives, because for the most part, we want to remember stuff. Right? We want to remember. And by the way, God wants us to remember too, which is why the word remember, if you're following along in your notes, the word remember is mentioned 168 times in the Bible. 168 times in the Bible. God doesn't want us to forget what he's done for us. God doesn't want us to forget what he's taught us. God doesn't want us to forget what he's called us to or who we are in him. And yet we are prone to forget, aren't we? I know I've had experiences where God showed me something or where God taught me something or came through for me in some amazing way, and I was absolutely convinced that I would never forget it, more to the point that I would stay so close to that memory that I would stay in awe of God for what he had done for me. And then in a period of time so short it's embarrassing, I found myself letting that memory or that lesson fade. And I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only one. As John Eldridge writes, virtually every person I've counseled follows a similar pattern. Not necessarily at first, never on command, but the lights turn on for these people. Their heart is lifted. Grateful tears flow. Suddenly, faith, hope, and love seem the only way to live, and I nearly dread the next session. When they return the following week, it's as though it never happened. That marvelous day is a distant memory. All is forgotten. I want to grab them and shake them into sense, shouting, don't you remember? Why did you let it slip away? Right? That's why the call to remember runs throughout the entire Bible, including Joshua 4, the story that we're going to be looking at today. And so if you've got a Bible, I would invite you to turn there with me to Joshua chapter 4. Uh, as you're turning there, let me review for you where we are in this story. This group of Hebrews whom God has been leading into the promised land. Remember, they were slaves in Egypt until God rescued them out of slavery. And then last week, right, we saw in Joshua chapter 3, God bring them to the very edge of the promised land where the only barrier between them and the land of Canaan the land of milk and honey, the only barrier between them was the Jordan River, which happened to be at flood stage. And then after the Hebrews camped next to this raging river for three days, right, waiting to hear from God about what they were supposed to do, God told the leaders to step into the Jordan River and to trust that as soon as their feet stepped foot into that raging river, that God would miraculously part the water so that everyone could walk across on dry ground. 
right? The end of Joshua 3 tells this story of that incredible miracle happening. Listen to it one more time. The end of Joshua 3 reads this way. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest, yet as soon as the priest who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. What an amazing story, right? This past week, I was trying to imagine what I would have been feeling once I had gotten to the other side of the Jordan River, had I been a part of this story, had I been a part of this, an incredible event. I'm pretty sure I would have been high-fiving everyone around me, right? I'm pretty sure I would have been making promises to God that I would never again doubt him or his faithfulness. I mean, I would have been ready, inspired to go into battle against the Canaanites right then and there. I would have been ready to take whatever hill God was calling me to take. And you know, I imagine there was a similar thing going on with the Hebrews that day. Right? I'm sure their morale was high. I'm sure they were thinking, we, we trust you now, God. You came through for us just like you promised. We won't be afraid anymore, Lord. We'll trust you. We're ready to take on the Canaanites. We're ready to enter into this land that you've promised us. In fact, I was also thinking this past week that from a military standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, if I were God, this was the perfect time to tell Joshua to rally the troops and go take on the Canaanites. Right? This is the time to strike while the iron is hot and the morale is high. And yet what you're going to see today is that God does not command them to go into battle at this point in the story. No, I want you to notice what God tells Joshua and the people to do next. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Here's the story. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So God here calls Israel to build a memorial, which again, from a military standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, my first reaction to this was like, wait, what, now? Like stop while the morale is high right now and build a monument, build a memorial stone? I mean, the the timing seems all wrong. I mean, building memorial now seems like a distraction. It seems like a waste of time. I mean, let's build the memorial, but can we build it later? Like right now, let's strike while the iron's hot. We're almost there. The promised land is literally right in front of us. And yet, God, if you're following along in your notes, God hits pause. God hits pause. Why does God hit pause? God hits pause to make sure his people build a monument in order to remember his faithfulness, in order to pass on this story to the next generation. Listen again to verse 7. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. This is what God does all the time throughout the scriptures, folks. He calls his people to build a memorial. He calls his people to write down the story. He calls his people to, to pass down a remembrance ritual to their children and to their grandchildren and to their great-grandchildren. 
Right? God does this all the time throughout the scriptures. I'm not going to give you a comprehensive list of all the times that God does this in the scripture, but here's a quick survey of examples if you want to follow along in your notes. The Passover meal. Right, the Passover Seder, this was instituted back in Exodus chapter 12. After God rescued his enslaved people from Egypt, he called them to begin an annual tradition of eating a Passover meal, a lamb, as this way of commemorating every single year the story of how he rescued them. How the angel of death, death graciously passed over all those who marked the doorpost of their homes with the blood of a spotless lamb. Right? Such this, this Passover meal has been celebrated for over 3,000 years. Instituted in Exodus chapter 12 is this way to remember God's rescue. Another remembrance ritual was the phylacteries. Some of you might be learning a new famous word that you can drop at the next cocktail party. Phylacteries. These were instituted in Deuteronomy chapter 6 after God gave Moses the book of the law. He called Israel to bind these words to their hands and to their foreheads so that they wouldn't forget his commands, so that they wouldn't forget his promises. And many of God's people took these verses so literally that they tied these phylacteries, which were basically these small wooden boxes, to their left arms and to their foreheads. And then they would place inside these boxes verses that spelled out the commandments and the promises of God. Why would they do this? So that they would not forget the commandments and the promises of God. Right? Another remembrance ritual was the Ebenezer, which was instituted in 1 Samuel 7, a couple of generations after what we're reading about here in the book of Joshua, after God delivered his people from the Philistine army. He called them to set up a memorial stone to mark the place where he rescued them and to name this memorial stone Ebenezer, which literally means, thus far has the Lord helped us. Some of you will know that song, Here I Raise My Ebenezer. It's this way of saying, thus far, Lord, you have helped us. You've helped me. The most important remembrance ritual in Scripture, though, is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, instituted by Jesus in the Gospels. Fast-forwarding a millennium or so, it was actually during the annual Passover meal that Jesus established with his disciples this tradition that we now call communion. The main point of which is to remember. To remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. See, Jesus wanted us to remember that he is the true Passover lamb, that he is the one who takes away our sins when his blood is applied to the doorposts and door frames of our hearts. And so one of the ways that Jesus helps us to remember this is to have us rehearse this truth every time we take this simple meal, every time we participate in this simple meal, which we did here at Trinity last Sunday. Right? This is why the Apostle Paul, writing some 25 years after this last supper between Jesus and his disciples, he says this to the believers at Corinth, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Right? Do this, Jesus says, in remembrance of me. God is doing this kind of thing all throughout the scriptures. Establishing these remembrance rituals so that we won't forget. Point of honesty, point of transparency, point of confession maybe. I used to think that rituals were just remnants of a dead religion. And I know sometimes rituals can become lifeless, just sort of like dead religiosity. But i got to say, more and more these days, I'm coming to realize that God's intent behind these reminders and these memorial stones and these ceremonial meals is to help us not forget who he is. Right? It's to help us not to forget what he's done for us, what he's taught us. Now, back to Joshua 4. Again, I think if I had been a part of this Israelite entourage, which had just experienced this miracle of walking across the Jordan River on dry ground, I honestly probably would have thought initially that building this memorial was a waste of time, a bit overkill. Like, really, God? 
Now's the time to do this. This, is, this just seems like a waste of time. I probably would have thought, Lord, do you really think I'm going to need a monument to remember how you just parted this river and we just walked across it on dry ground? Do you really think I'm going to need some memorial stones to remind me to tell this amazing story to my kids and to my grandkids? To which God says, yeah, I do think you'll need this because you can't even remember where you put your phone. <laughs> right? And God is right. Because we do have this tendency to forget. Maybe not all together, but we have this tendency to let memories fade. See, at least for me, it's not that I completely forget the gospel. Right? It's not that I completely forget that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. It's that the beauty of the gospel sometimes fades. It's that my sense of awe at what God has done for me in Christ sometimes fades fades to where I start to forget who I am in Christ. I start to forget all that I have in Christ. I start to forget all that I'm being prepared for in Christ and all that he is preparing for me through Christ. Which is why one of the most important questions in our spiritual journey is this question, so then how do we stay close to the gospel? Right? How do we keep our spiritual memory of God and his goodness close in our minds. How do we remember all that God has done for us? And let me just say, friends, for most of us, I don't think the answer is for me to stand up here and yell at you to remember. Most of us want to remember. Most of us want to remember who God is and what God has done for us in Christ. The issue for most of us is how to jog our memories so that we stay focused on all that God has done for us when we have a tendency to get distracted by lesser things. Are you with me? I know I have a tendency to get distracted by lesser things. And my guess is that most of you do too. And so I want to get practical for the next few minutes this morning, sharing a few ideas that have been helpful for me in jogging my spiritual memory. Ideas that help me to stay focused on what God has done for me in Christ. And my hope is that there might be one or two of these ideas that you adopt that might be helpful for you in jogging your spiritual memory, helping your spiritual memory stay sharp. Here's the first one. It's a really simple one. Carrying a nail in my pocket. Carrying a nail in my pocket. I do this one from time to time because it's a very simple practice that jogs my memory and reminds me of what Jesus did for me. See, my mind does not drift naturally toward thinking about the cross throughout the day. I wish it did, but point of honesty, it doesn't. And so I need reminders. And this one on occasion helps, such that when I put my hand in my pocket to retrieve my keys or to get my phone and I feel the sharp end of a nail, it's this quick, tangible reminder of what Jesus did for me. That just right in the middle of my day just moves me to like, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for what you did for me. It's a simple one, carrying a nail around in my pocket. Number two, prayer journaling. Prayer journaling. And let me just say for me, and this is not true for everyone, because for some people, prayer journaling is like a fate worse than death. Okay, so I don't want to load you down this morning, but I'll just, point of transparency, for me, prayer journaling, writing, taking inventory of what God has done for me, or what God has given me, or what God is preparing for me, it's this helpful way for me to remember. And so every few weeks or so, my prayer journal is a very simple inventory exercise where I reflect on what God has done for me or what God is preparing for me. Here's an example of one such entry. It simply reads, Heavenly Father, I have so much to thank you for. Forgiveness of my sins and new life in Christ. The gift of your word so that I can know you better. Your spirit living in me, encouraging me, correcting me, guiding me, helping me. A wife and children and their spouses who love you a roof over our heads and food on our table, the privilege of preaching your word and pointing people to Jesus, and the hope of heaven and a new life in a new body on a new earth. Amen? It took about five minutes for me to make that list, to do that inventory exercise. And then the prayer that I wrote at the end of that inventory exercise was this, Lord, I thank you for all that you've given me. Help me to live today fully aware of all your good gifts and fully grateful for all that you've done for me. Again, my point is this, at least for me, my memory gets jogged when I take just five minutes to write out 
some of what God has done for me, some of what God has given me, some of what God is preparing for me. So think about prayer journaling, if you hate prayer journaling, maybe as a five-minute exercise. Number three, memorizing scripture. I know I put this one out there, and the hair on the back of some of your necks has just gone up. Because I know there are some folks, like, they get really intimidated when they hear the pastor talk about memorizing scripture. Because there's this idea that you've got to have a photographic memory to do it. You don't. You don't. The truth is, we all memorize stuff. Right? Let me prove it to you. Two plus two equals twinkle, twinkle, little. The Notre Dame fighting. That was to make up for Nate. We have unity in Christ. Amen? Although some of you are like, really too early. Do we even have to bring that team up right now? Here's my point. Whether it's math facts, nursery rhymes, or sports teams, mascots, we all memorize stuff. Memorizing scripture is not that different, except that it's one of the most effective ways we can stay close to what God has done for us in Christ and who we are in Christ. And contrary to what some people believe, it does not take hours to memorize scripture. Let me just give you a window into how this has worked in my life. Several years ago, I was talking about this a few weeks back, several years ago, I was finding myself getting anxious on Sunday mornings. And so I decided to memorize a simple scripture about God's peace that I could recite when I got anxious. So I didn't try to memorize an entire book of the Bible. I didn't try to memorize an entire chapter of the Bible. I just took this verse, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, where it says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Right, a very simple verse. Philippians 4, 6, 7. I spent about five minutes a day for one week working on that verse, and I had it memorized. And then on those Sundays when I would feel myself drifting into anxiety, I would recite this verse out loud, because there's something powerful about reciting Scripture out loud. I would recite this verse to myself out loud as this way of preaching to myself, as this way of reminding myself of this truth. I remember doing this every Sunday for several weeks until I realized I now had this verse hidden in my heart like the Bible talks about such that I can now recite this verse whenever I get anxious, not just on Sunday mornings, but whenever I find myself in a set of circumstances where I'm drifting toward worry. Let me give you a couple of other examples of how this works. Again, with simple, short, strategic scriptures. Let's say you struggle to remember that God loves you. I know a lot of Christians, this is a real thing. You operate so much on feelings, right? Like, do I feel God's love? And so for some of us who allow our feelings to dictate how God feels about you, I would encourage you to memorize a verse like Romans 5, 8, which says this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Historical event. Memorizing a simple verse like this one, it reminds us that we don't have to wonder if God loves us because God already proved it by dying for us. God demonstrated it by dying for us in Christ. Or let's say you struggle with people pleasing. Maybe you've got a fear of man issue. You get too concerned about what people think about you. I would encourage you to memorize a very simple verse like Galatians 1.10 where Paul says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. You see how this works? Short, simple, strategic verses. Right? Whatever you need to remember about God, whatever you need to remember about yourself, find a short, simple verse that reinforces that truth. And let me just tell you, I'll be glad to help you find a verse that corresponds with wherever you're struggling. And then just take five minutes or so a day for one week reciting it to yourself out loud because there's something powerful about reciting scripture out loud and then before long you will have it and it will have taken root in your heart that's number three number four strategically placed notes this one is based on deuteronomy chapter six verse eight where god told his people the israelites tie these truths as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates uh, Amanda and our daughters, when our daughters were still living at home, really took this verse to heart. In fact, if you walked through our home back in the day, you would have found scriptures on our walls, on their desks, on their chalkboards, on mirrors, and in the kitchen cupboards. In fact, let me give you a, 
An example, my favorite example of this from my daughter Glory's life from several years ago when she was just a little girl, and I do have permission to tell this story. I will Venmo her $5 for a Starbucks drink, though, at the end of this day. <laughs> right? Back when Glory was in third grade, she really struggled to understand God's forgiveness. She really struggled to understand God's peace. Right? She strived so hard to be the perfect little girl. Amanda and I, for several years, just thought she had this very compliant disposition but inside, she was anxious and stressed out because she was trying to be morally perfect. I didn't know it at the time, but a few years ago, Glory told me how she would make these vows before going to bed that when she woke up the next morning, she was going to live that day sinlessly. Of course, all those vows did was continually lead Glory to despair when she fell short of God's perfect standard, which we all do. And yet still, Glory would keep going back and forth between vowing to be perfect and then despairing when she fell short. Well, when I finally picked up on what was going on in my little girl, I decided that on our next daddy-daughter date, we would go to Starbucks, we'd get some hot chocolate, and we would look together at Romans 5, 1, where it says, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked about how peace with God doesn't come through our behaving well enough for God to accept us. Peace comes through believing what God did to make us acceptable. You hear the difference between behaving well enough to make God accept me and believing what God did in Christ to make me acceptable. Well, to make a long story short, that was one of those light bulb moments where Romans 5.1 broke the spell of moralism and opened Glory's eyes to the good news of the gospel. It was beautiful. I could see it in her face. But then right after that breakthrough, and I'm talking like 10 minutes after that breakthrough, I remember Glory, Glory asking me the question, but what if I forget? What if I forget? And so after our date, we went to the store, and we bought markers and paper so she could write out this verse in bright celebratory colors and tape it to her ceiling right above her bed so that it was the first thing she read in the morning and the last thing she read at night. In fact, here it is, because I kept it. I see it on the screen behind me. The point being that whenever she slipped back into thinking that it was up to her to be good enough to earn God's forgiveness, this verse on her ceiling would jog her memory, help her to remember the truth of the gospel, help her remember what God has done for her. I share this story, folks, because maybe there's a scripture verse that you would do well to put on your ceiling or your bathroom mirror or the front screen of your computer or phone, or somewhere to remind yourself of some truth that you know God wants you to stay close to. Now let me say, there are a lot of other remembrance exercises that can help us stay close to what God has done for us and called us to. By the way, one of the most important ones is that we are we're doing one of them right now. We're gathering together to worship God and to hear his word. We do this every seven days. Why do we do that? Because we are prone to forget. So God has given us this means of grace called corporate worship where we gather together to sing to him, but we're also singing within earshot of each other. We hear his word so that we remember who he is and what he's done for us. Right? There are other remembrance exercises that we can tap into as well, like reading God's word on a daily basis. Right, for the 450 plus of you who are doing NT260, reading the word daily is this reminder daily of who God is, what he's done for us, what that means for our lives. And for those of us who are doing that in person or over Zoom or through text, NT260 is this way to remind each other of who God is, to remind each other of what he's done for us and what that means for our lives. Again, the bottom line of all these remembrance exercises and practices is that we all need ways to stay close to what God has done for us, which is why God tells the Israelites here in Joshua 4, right after they've crossed the Jordan River, 
to hit pause and build a river rock memorial, which they ultimately do. Take a look at verses 8 and 9. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. God hits pause. Strategically, strike while the iron is hot. Now God hits pause and says, I want you to build a monument that will help you remember what I've done for you, that you can pass on to the next generation. Friends, we all need ways to remember who God is and what God has done for us, which is what leads me to invite you to consider a couple of next steps this morning. I want to encourage you to write down one thing on your message notes, one thing that God has done for you that you know you need to stay close to. Maybe a lesson that he's taught you, maybe a gift that he's given you, maybe an answer to some prayer or maybe ultimately what he's done for you in Christ when he died for your sins and rose from the dead. And then I want you to summarize that one thing that you need to stay close to in just a few words. And then here's what I want you to do with those few words, with a Sharpie. Hopefully you've got a Sharpie or maybe someone next to you's got a Sharpie that you can borrow when they're done with it. I want you to transcribe those few words onto this memorial rock of remembrance. You got rocks that were sitting on your chair when you came in here. Right? I want you to transcribe those words onto this river rock of remembrance. And then I want you to place this rock somewhere where you'll see it. So that it serves as a monument, if you will. A memorial stone of remembrance of what God has done for you. Or what God has given you. Or what God has taught you. Or what God's preparing for you. Right? Maybe you want to put it on your doorstep so that it's the first thing that you see when you come home. Maybe you want to put it on your desk, right? Because at work, you have the highest inclination to forget about Jesus, right? Maybe you want to put it on your window. So, but put it somewhere, put it someplace where you'll see it so that it reminds you of what you need to remember so that you're inspired to keep trusting God, right? Here's my rock, which simply says the cross, Right, I keep it in my office. Some of you have heard me say before, I'm really a one-trick pony. Every message points to Jesus and the cross. You guys keep coming back. <laughs> Every message, all of Scripture, it points to Jesus. It points to what he did for us on the cross. This serves as a reminder to me to keep that clear. So I keep it in my office. And then number four, finally, I, I would just invite you to talk, text, Zoom, phone, or post about your rock as this way of witnessing to others what God has done for you, what God has taught you, what God is preparing for you. See, that's part of the reason that God had Israel build this monument, not only so that they would remember God's grace, but so that they would be a witness to others of God's grace. In fact, if you jump down to verse 24, you'll see that one of the reasons for this miracle and this monument was to be a witness to the world of who God is and what he's done. Look at the beginning of verse 24. It simply says this. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. See, the good news of what God has done for us is never just for us. It's for others, too. It's for others too, which is why my prayer this week is that you and I would be reminded of those memories of God's provision. We would be reminded of God's instruction. We would be reminded of what he's done for us. Not only so that we remain inspired to keep trusting God for ourselves, but so that our very lives might be a living monument, if you will, to others. That they might see God's grace and God's greatness through us jars of clay. So as the worship team comes ahead, and with river rock in hand, I want you to take a moment to think about something that God has done for you. Think about something that God has done for you that you need to stay close to. And then as we sing, or maybe later today if you need some more time, I want to encourage you to write it down in a few words on this river rock, and then place it somewhere where it will jog your memory to remember and reflect 
on God's grace and God's greatness. So I'm going to pray. I invite you to pray with me or keep your eyes open and work on your river rock. I don't care. Father God, thank you again for what you've done for us in Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you that you are also willing to condescend to us forgetful beings. Even when we don't forget completely what you've done for us, Lord, we are guilty of letting it fade. We are guilty of allowing lesser things to take over our minds. And so, Lord, I just would pray that by your Spirit, you would use these means of grace to jog our spiritual memories. Gathering together every seven days to worship you and to hear your word. Maybe prayer journaling, maybe writing verses down in strategic places. Maybe this River Rock Memorial would be a, a means of us staying close to the things that you've taught us. Of us staying close to who you are and what you've done for us in Christ. Lord, so in humility, we just acknowledge that we're a forgetful people. And we pray that you would help us to remember through these means of grace you've given us. Even now, Lord, as we, as we do this transcribing onto a river rock, Lord, or maybe later today, I pray that you would meet with us. And that it wouldn't just be for today, Lord, that, that this would be a means of grace that we come back to, that we see when we need to see it, that reminds us of who you are and what you've done for us. Not just for ourselves, but so that we live the kind of lives that as people look in on our lives, they ultimately see a monument that points to your greatness and your grace. So do that work in us and among us and through us for your glory and our good. And all God's people agreed and said, amen. Let's worship. If you want to stay working on your rock, go for it.